Sambhujasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhudasa Namujasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhudasa Namujasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhudasa Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. To get a bell ringer. <laughs> you can tell I'm doing two jobs here. <laughs> okay. Um, tonight, what we're going to do is we are going to go into some suttas because we like to do that every Saturday. And we're going to be using parts of number five. And we're going to be using a section of, um, or we're going to do parts of section, parts of number 12. And we're going to be using some sections of number five. And we're probably going to answer other questions by jumping into some suttas too. Um, and I may have mentioned it, but we're really going to go by what's on our board tonight. And um, so let's go look at what's on the board. I hope everybody had a good week. I get pictures and they can't smile, but I hope everybody's smiling. <laughs> okay, that's good. There's our deek. Okay, that's good. Oh, good. That makes me feel good. All right. So we're going, to, we're going to go into the share screen first and bring up this document. And the first part is answering the question, the other part of the question I didn't answer before. Okay, and then we can go right into this. Uh, now, everybody, I hope you have some equanimity that's going in your life because when we do, whoops, I'm sorry, what did I just do? I don't know what I did. Wait a second. Let me do this again. Uh, I love technology. Did you know technology was invented to make your life easier? And then it, it advanced. And when they made those little creatures who are AI and they have their own brains and think for themselves, when they put them inside the computers, then everything that my computer teacher told me became a lie because he swore to me when he taught me about the computer. The computer would never do anything unless I told it to. And you know what? That's not true. <laughs> that is absolutely not true. So it's probably true, but I don't know how it's true. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, so one of the first questions we're gonna look at here is, um, wait a second, I'm still there, okay. <clears throat> One of the first questions that we're going to look at here, I'm, <laughs> I'm having so much fun, it's so funny. All right, um, here, wait a minute. There. Did the Buddha suffer at all during his journey in order to discover the way to Nibbana? You know, this is an interesting question. Sometimes people from different religions will come and talk to me about suffering and um, they're, they will sort of almost come and say, yes, but, but that's, it was very different in my faith, the person who's teaching really, really, really suffered. And I'm there just so, if you've never heard this before, brace yourself. But what I'm going to show you is what happened to the Buddha, what he did for the six and a half or six or six and a half years when he was searching for the answer to the suffering. And first of all, he goes in that direction out of compassion in his heart. And we can say a couple things about this journey is that he didn't go out there um, to start this quest simply for Buddhists, because there weren't any. It's a, that's a no-brainer. There were no Buddhists, so he didn't go to do this just for them. The second thing that ha about it is that he wanted to know the answer. Every, ever since he was young, you hear the story about the swan with Devadatta, who is his cousin, who's always giving him problems. And you hear what he did with the swan. And that story tells you he was someone who had a lot of compassion in his heart, a lot of compassion in his heart. And he did this, literally this quest to find an answer for humanity, for human beings. It wasn't just for the people in his palace, 
It wasn't just for him and his family. It was totally out there for humanity. So <clears throat> in those days, the only preface I'm going to say to you before I read this to you is that um, there was a belief at that time in the practice of meditation that the different sects that were competing with each other with their philosophies, the ones who were trying to open their mind up, they were attempting to make a lot of suffering and pain happen in the body so that the mind would open up. This is kind of a funny thing because in the end, he finds out mind body is connected and mind is the forerunner of all states up here before the body. And this is, turns out to be the command center. So when we're going back to figure out what the Buddha actually did and find out his instructions, this is interesting because we go back to the, as close to his words as we can. And that's the Pali Canon. And Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, in my opinion, is the most workable, consistent um, translation. My teacher started with that one in 1995. It was the first English workable translation. The PBS version, PTS version, was not um, theoretically, it wasn't, it didn't make sense for uh, linguists translation to be considered close enough to what was really happening because the people who did the translation were not, um, I just lost my picture. Let's see, go back again. Um, the people, the translation was not, um, oh, come on, go back here, go again. The translation was done by linguists, and when they did the translation as linguists, um, then they're not meditators, is my point. And so they're doing it. And I witnessed with Bonte at Washington State University the translation for a section of the texts that were found underneath the statues that were in Afghanistan when they blew those statues up when in the remains, the archaeologists found some uh, scrolls. And the scrolls were divided between seven different countries in different universities for translation. And the translation group, I saw the difficulty that was happening in the room when we worked for something like six hours each day and we were there for two days in a row. That was enough to see how they were struggling with seven people in the room from Mahayana, Theravada, and, Mah and um, Vajrayana representatives trying to figure out what a Theravada monk was writing in these scrolls. But it was being treated as if the translations were, work was being treated as if we found, my comparison or simile is we found a Roman village. Now we're going to explain how it was constructed. But actually the monk was attempting to tell you how the practice works. And Bonte and I were struggling against these people with all their master's degrees and PhDs to, to try to get across the point. This was actually, he was talking about parts of the practice in what they were struggling to translate. And finally, they, they, came, they agreed with us, but I don't know what they put in the book in the end. I've lost the screen again. Um, Wait a minute. I don't know how to do this. I have to keep going back here. I never had this happen before. Okay, now. Um, okay. So here we go. This is the section of the Maha um, Shanada Sutta, the Maha Shanada Sutta. Sutta number 12 in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's on page 173 if you have the Majjhima Nikaya. Okay, it's the, this is the section on the Bodhisattva's austerities. And remember what we're, the reason it's happening is because they're trying to cause so much pain in the body that the mind will open and something will happen where the mind opens up. That's what was going on. Sariputta, I recall having lived a holy life possessing four factors, 
I have been an ascetic, a supreme ascetic. I have been coarse, supremely coarse. I have been scrupulous, supremely scrupulous. And I have been secluded, supremely secluded. Such was my asceticism, sorry, Puta, that I went naked, rejecting conventions, licking my hands, not coming when asked to, not stopping when asked. I did not accept food brought or food specially made or any invitation to a meal. I received nothing from a pot, from a bowl, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food was advertised to be distributed, from where a dog was waiting, from where flies were buzzing. I accepted no fish or meat. I drank no liquor, no wine or fermented brews. I kept to one house <clears throat> to one morsel. I kept to two houses for two morsels. I kept to three houses for three morsels. I kept to four houses for four morsels, for five houses and five morsels, for six houses and six morsels, and for seven houses and seven morsels. I lived on one saucerful a day on two saucerfuls a day, up to seven saucerfuls a day. I then took food once a day, once every two days, up to once every seven days, and thus even up to once every fortnight. I dwelt pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. I was an eater of greens or millet or wild rice or hide pairings, or moss, or rice bran, or rice scum, or sesame flour, or grass, or cow dung. I lived on forest roots and fruits. I fed on fallen fruits. I clothed myself in hemp, in hemp mixed cloth, in shrouds, in refuse rags, in tree bark, in antelope's hide, in strips of antelope hide, in kusa grass. Kusa grass is so sharp that if it rubs you, it'll cut your flesh. In bark fabric, in wood shavings fabric, in head hair wool, in animal wool, in owl's wings, I was one who pulled out the hair and beard, pursuing the practice of pulling out hair and beard. I was one who stood continuously rejecting seats. I was one who squatted continuously, devoted to maintaining the squatting position. I was one who used a mattress of spikes. I made a mattress of spikes my bed. I dwelt pursuing the practice of bathing in water three times daily, including the evening. And thus, in such a variety of ways, I dwelt pursuing the practice of tormenting myself and mortifying the body. Such was my asceticism. Such was my coarseness, Sariputta, that just as the bowl of a tindukkha tree accumulating over the years cakes and flakes off its bark, so too the dust and dirt accumulated over the years and caked off my body and flaked off. It never occurred to me, oh, let me rub this dirt or rub dust off with my hand or let another rub it off. It never occurred to me thus such was my coarseness, and such was my scrupulousness, Sariputta, that I was always mindful in stepping forwards, stepping backwards. I was full of pity even in regard to a drop of water thus, 
let me not hurt the tiny creatures in the crevices of the ground. Such was my scrupulousness. Such was my seclusion, Sariputta, and I would plunge into some forest and just dwell there. And when I saw a cow herd or a shepherd or someone gathering grass or sticks or a woodsman, I would flee from grove to grove, from thicket to thicket, from hollow to hollow, from hillock to hillock. And why was that? So that they would not see me and I would see them or I would see them because just as a forest bred deer on seeing human beings flees from a grove to a grove or a thicket to a thicket, from a hollow to a hollow, from a hillock to a hillock. So too, when I saw a cowherd or any shepherd, such was my seclusion. And I would go on all fours to the cow pens when the cattle had gone out and the cowherd had left the area to feed on the dung of the young suckling calves as long as my own excrement and urine lasted. I fed on my own excrement and my own urine. Such was my great practice of feeding on filth. I would plunge into some awe-inspiring awe grove and dwell there, a grove so awe-inspiring that it would make most of a man's hairs stand up on end if he were not freed from the lust. When those cold wintry nights came during the eight days period of snowfall, I would dwell by night in the open and by day in the grove. In the last month of the hot season, I would dwell by day in the open, by night in the grove. And there came to me spontaneously a stanza never heard before, chilled by night and scorched by day, alone in awe-inspiring groves, naked with no fire to sit beside, the sage yet pursues his quest. I would make my bed in a charnel ground. This is the place where they burn the bodies with the bones of the dead for a pillow. And the cowherd boys came up and they spat upon me and urinated on me and threw dirt at me and poked sticks into my ears. But I do not recall that I ever aroused an evil mind of hate against them. Such was my abiding in equanimity. Sariputta, there were certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this, Purification comes about through food. They say, let us live on cola fruits or let us eat the cola fruits. And they eat the cola fruit powder and they drink the cola fruit water and they make many kinds of cola fruit concoctions. But now I recall having eaten a single cola fruit in one day, Sariputta. You may think that a cola fruit was bigger at that time yet you should not regard it so, for the cola fruit was then at most the same size as it is now, which is very small. Through feeding on a single cola fruit a day, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. And because of eating so little, my limbs became like jointed segments of vine stems or bamboo stems. Because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof. And because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. And because of eating so little, the gleam in my eyes sank back down into their sockets and looking like a gleam of water that has sunk far down into the well that's deep. Because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and the sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. And thus, if I wanted to touch my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. And if I wanted to touch my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Because of eating so little, 
if I wanted to defecate or urinate, I fell on my face right there because of eating so little. If I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots and fell from my body as I rubbed. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this, purification comes about through food. And they say, let us live on beans or sesame or eat rice. And they eat rice powder, drink rice water, make the kinds of rice concoctions. Now I recall having eaten a single rice grain, one a day, Sariputta. And you may think that rice grains were bigger at the time, but you shouldn't regard it. So for the rice was then the most, the same size as it is now. So through feeding on a single rice grain, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. And because of eating so little, the hair rotted off its roots and fell from my body and as I rubbed. But by such conduct and such practice and such performance of austerities, I did not attain any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge or vision worthy of the noble ones. And why was that? Because I did not attain the noble wisdom, which when attained is noble and em emancipating and leads the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. And what is it when we talk about wisdom? Do you remember? Wisdom in Buddhism refers to dependent origination. And once he finds dependent origination, he starts to see there's, there's something here that shows exactly how this works. And then he pursues attempting to see how this is all gonna work. And I'll show you where it happens in the text in a minute. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is purification comes through the round of rebirths as well. But it's not easy to find a realm in the round that I have not already passed through on a long journey, except for the gods of the pure abodes. And I had, had I passed through the round as a god in the pure abodes, I would never have returned to this world. So he didn't go into the realms, when you talk about the 30 some odd levels, he didn't go into the realms where the gods were. He didn't in all those times, 100,000 lifetimes. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is the purification comes through some particular kind of rebirth, but it is not easy to find a kind of rebirth I've not been reborn in already on this long journey except of course for the gods and pure abodes. And there are certain recluses whose doctrine and view is that purification comes through some particular abode. We still have that situation with Pure Land Buddhism where the people basically work to do as much compassionate service as possible in this life with the intention of passing away and being reborn in the pure abodes so that there they can be taught the way to Nibbana and go through to the attainments. So they bypass the, um, the major attainments, the highest level attainment, they bypass them. And the commitment in the Bodhisattva vow, the way it is set up today, is very different from the original vow. When you examine what it says, but more than more fun than examining the Bodhisattva vow, what it was and what it is, is just interviewing people today who take Bodhisattva vows. If you do it with about eight or ten people, I did it at a big monastery in New York, and and about ten people I asked, and they all gave me different stories what the vow meant, and I jotted it down in a notebook. It was it was a remarkable experience. And basically, some people feel it's so important to do compassionate service in this life, we should put everything else aside. And I met people who were, their marriages were breaking up, their children were just so angry because the parents weren't home for the family to exist. It was so heavily done. And the merit system in the prophecies of the Buddha, the prophecies themselves talk about a time when merit will become so important and the teaching won't even exist anymore. 
So these things are all coming to pass in the prophecies. There are 16 prophecies. That's something someday if you want to do that, you let me know. There's a, we'll just read all 16 of them and you can do what you want with them. It, but it's quite fascinating because most of them are right in front of us right now. But it's not the end of the story. It's interesting. There's something else going on there. But it's not easy to find an abode that I have not already dwelt in, he tells Sariputta. There are certain recluses whose doctrine is purification comes through sacrifice. And if it's not easy to find the kind of a kind of sacrifice that has not already been offered up by me on this long journey when I was either a head anointed noble king or a well-to-do Brahmin. So he says that he's tried everything basically. And then he says there's also a way through fire worship. There's also as long um, and a, a way through the, through, to do it through uh, being a Brahmin and going through the journey that way. Sariputta, there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrines view as long as this good man, young and black haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth and the prime of life, so long as he, he perfects he is he so long is he perfect in his lucid wisdom but when this good man is old and aged and burdened with years advanced in life and comes to the last stage of living being 80 90 or 100 years old then the lucidity of his wisdom is lost he loses it but it, it should not be regarded so because i am now old aged and burdened with years advanced in my life, and I come to the last stage, my years have turned 80. And now suppose that I had four disciples with a hundred years span, perfect in mindfulness, retentiveness, memory, and lucidity of wisdom, just as a skilled archer takes and practices and tested could easily shoot a light arrow across the shadow of a palm tree, suppose that they were even to that extent, they were perfect in their mindfulness and retentiveness and memory and lucidity of wisdom. And suppose that they continuously asked me about the four foundations of mindfulness and I answered them when asked and they remembered each answer of mine and never asked a subsidiary question or paused except to eat, drink and consume food, to taste and urinate and defecate and rest in order to remove sleepiness and their tiredness. And still the Tathagata's exposition of the Dhamma his explanations of the factors of the Dhamma, his replies to the questions would not yet come to an end. But meanwhile, the four disciples of mine with their hundred year lifespan have died in, in, at the end of those hundred years. <coughs> Sorry, Puta, even you have to carry me about on a bed now. Still, there will be no change in the lucidity of the Tathagata's wisdom. Your mind will stay clear. You will be able to speak about the Dhamma until the day you die, and anything you say will be understood and remembered. So this is giving you an idea. That's the end of that section. But what I wanted to take you one other place, because in 36, Majima Nikaya number 36, if you go to page 340, 340 and you go to section 31, you will find out that this, this is an interesting sutta. 36 is very precious to us uh, because it contradicts everything that's in sutta number 20. <laughs> that's, that's one of the reasons it's so precious. And the, what happened in sutta number 20 was that it talked about really working hard and struggling to stop a hindrance and force it and to stop, subdue it, suppress it, eradicate it, annihilate it, destroy it. <laughs> this is all pressure, pressure, pressure on the hindrance. Okay, but here when we come to 36, uh, he talks about his practice with the breathing. He talks about his practice with what's happening now. I love it when it's tries to talk to me. Um, okay. Right. Um, 
the sutta in the first part of the sutta in 36 is telling you about the breathing meditation and how he was trying to hold his breath. We're talking about the, the breath meditation, how you hold your breath and stop breathing completely. And he did this until it completely passed out and turned blue. In order to do that, he had to clip right here on the tongue, like here, put the tongue on the top of your mouth. There's a little tiny thing underneath the bottom of the tongue. You cut it and then you swallow your tongue so you cannot breathe at all. And then you breathe, you're breathing enough to survive oxygen through your ears into the eustachian tube is the theory behind this. And he did it until he turned blue and passed out. And then he told the monks, no matter what I did, no matter what bothered me, I fought with it as hard as I could and I, I took less, I, I breathed less and less and less and less but it didn't do any good. And he keeps telling them the actual 36 is a uh, contradicting everything that you said to do in 20, as far as the hindrances are concerned. And he, instead of fighting them, by the time he writes this sutta, we know that he understands how they operate. What is the food for the hindrance, the disturbance in the practice? And how do you handle it? And it isn't by fighting with it, because we discover the nutriment for the distraction, for the disturbance, is my personal attention. So if I move to it, it's guaranteed it's going to come back. And if you want to get stuck with the hindrances for months and months, all you have to do is go say, who are you? Why are you here? You know, identify yourself. What's the cause of this? And you do that, they'll be there for six months, a year or more. You will suffer like nobody's business. And it's guaranteed that that will happen because every time you pay attention to a hindrance, even to note it and name it at all, you are in denial of the fact that in the Samyutta Nikaya, it explains to you the nourishment and denourishment of a hindrance, okay? And that's on 1594, I think, page 1594. You can start reading in that area in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Bojanga Samyutta. Because if you do that with a hindrance, if you fight it, then the seven enlightenment factors will never arise and you will not be able to go into the super mundane type of cessation with the super mundane nibbana. Okay, here in 36 on page 340, he stops with what he's talking about to the monks and he says, um, first of all, that he realized in, in section 30, he just realized that all of the things he went through with the painful racking piercing feelings due to exertion over, over that, um, he did not, oh, let's read it to I thought whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, meaning trying to stop the hindrances. This is the utmost, there is none beyond this. We're at the end of the list of what they tried to do and he tried to do. Okay, and then what he says next is, and whatever, Recluses and Brahmins at present experience the painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, again, fighting the hindrances. This is the utmost, and there is none beyond this. But by this racking practice of austerities, I have not ever attained any superhuman states or any distinction in knowledge and vision that is worthy of the noble ones. And he says to himself, all of a sudden, while he's meditating that night, could there be another way to enlightenment than what I've been doing? <laughs> That's what he says. And now we start at 31. I considered, I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied with the harvest festival in the field with all the people doing the blessing while I was sitting in the shade, the cool shade of a rose apple tree, Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states I entered upon, and I abided in the first jhana. He fell. He fell into a jhana. When I say he fell, it is, I am trying to give you a simile 
that he just fell like like the pool the first part of it before you go into the first jhana is like a lake and it has to get full enough of water if you can imagine in your mind that it's going to go over the first of eight waterfalls and there's eight waterfalls and under a waterfall is always a pothole a big hole from the wa water hitting it and so in order for the rain to come and fill the waterfall up it has to start at the pond at the top and when the rain comes and fills the pond it flows over and it fills up this pothole and rises up so it can fall into the next level the second jhana so what happened under the tree he sat there quietly and just by himself he fell into this jhana and this is where he remembers what happened i entered upon and abided in the first jhana which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion could that be the path to enlightenment then following on that memory came the realization that indeed is the path to enlightenment because when he looked he couldn't remember any tension any tightness any disturbance at all he could only remember he was there and he just got to this place where the conditions were right and he fell into the first jhana i thought to myself am i afraid of that pleasure that was nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states i thought i am not afraid of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwor unwholesome states and I considered it is not easy to attain a pleasure with the body so excessively emaciated. He was exhausted from everything he had done. You've seen the statues of the Buddha with the skeleton, like we just described what he went through and how you could feel from your skin on your chest. I had a baby once and the doctor was a clown and he, he left me on the he left me on the gurney in the hallway for a minute before they took me to my room and I was cold, you know, because the baby had come out and that was my heater. <laughs> and I got I was so cold and he came over and he said you know um I'll show you something really funny it was a Catholic doctor and he had such a sense of humor and he said give me your hand and I he took my hand and put it on my stomach it went right to my backbone and I could feel my discs and the bumps on my backbone I could put my hand on them just lying there, reached down, put my hand on them. I was shocked and he said, that's really something, isn't it? Because your organs haven't come back in yet. They're gonna fall in when you go to sleep tonight. They're gonna all just fall back in and fill up the space where the baby was. This is an experience and this is exactly how skinny he was because he was actually like that, that his stomach skin was all the way touching his backbone and he couldn't touch his backbone without his stomach skin or his stomach skin without touching his backbone it's amazing that he survived so he says suppose i eat some food and this is where he comes out of the funk literally and he says okay i'm gonna put myself together, take a bath, stop all these austerities, and I'm gonna see what it's like if I just sit and watch what happens if I just fall. I allow myself to just fall, like I did when I was a little boy. And then he gets to be awakened. After that happens, not before. And this happens just very close to the time when he sits under the tree. He's got a, probably a couple of weeks where he pulls himself together, eating milk, rice, and milk, rice, and certain other very easy food and takes a bath and everything and cleans himself up. So this is what we're talking about. He figures out there's another way. If you want to understand what happened to him when he came out of this, um, you should go and get a big tree in a botanical garden and sit down, put yourself, we have pine trees at home. If you can find pine trees that smell like pine, it's a good idea to put a, you know, big blanket at the base of a big pine tree. And because the 
certain bad bugs and stuff won't come around you and snakes won't come near pine trees that much. And that's where you sit and then watch what happens. And you just lean against the tree or have the base of your back against the tree and you just stay there for a couple hours and see what happens to understand what happened to him. And that's what Bonte did. He said, go in the woods and see what happened. <laughs> and we used to send the students in our forest to certain areas where there were nice big pine trees. So this gives you an idea about what this was about. Okay, and then the other thing in section five, um, all right, we're not gonna do that quite yet. Let's look at some of these questions. I wanna see, is Effendi, is he here yet? Yeah, did he come? I don't know how to get back here. Let's see, stop sharing. Is Effendi here tonight? No, I don't think so, is no. he? He's not here. Well, he can always go and listen to me explain this, but I'm gonna do it now, okay? Um, you can always go and listen to it. Uh, we, he brought a question in the last class. He brought up a question. And this had to do with some texts that exist that are talking about fear about the jhanas. So what I didn't say to you, I'm just going to read this to you. When we hear about fear uh, in the, of the jhanas today, we do hear that from some monks who heard these texts and took it to mean that all jhana is bad and we should stay away from it. We need to first find out what kind of meditation we are, we are asking about. That's what we need to find out. First, we need to ask what was actually said about the jhanas. We need to see the text and read exactly what it says. And I think he said he found it in the, um, the Anguttara Nikaya, okay? And it might be in there somewhere and I'd like to see what it is. I'd like to have somebody tell me where it is so I can look at it very closely, but I can tell you what's, what happened here. I woke up the next morning and said, why? <laughs> Why didn't you tell them this? You know, so the question you need to ask is, what are we actually set, talking about these jhanas? By whom did we hear this said? Or where, especially about what kind of meditation was it that this jhana was in? So there should be no fear of what I am guiding you through based on the meditation found in what? In the Anupada Sutta. Because the Anupada Sutta 111 is where Twim is coming from. And this was a report, that Sutta was a report on Sariputta's practice being repeated to a large group of monks by the Buddha as being the proper way of meditation. And if like basically saying, it, the talk at the end of the Sutta was implying, if you all teach this way, this is exactly what I, I did and this is exactly what you should be teaching people. So practice being repeated uh, to a large group of monks is what was happening and the Buddha was being sorry, Pucha's personal report to them. This is there's the uh, the meditation is precisely uh, was correctly investigated by Sariputta. It was observed during the practice, and the same revelations can be found by us as we practice if we practice in the same way and follow it exactly the way he's doing it. The uh, question arises due to the existence of of. Um, the, exist, the existence of absorption jhanas, which are quite different from the aware jhanas that we're teaching you and that are being described here. So what is an absorption jhana? For those of you who don't understand the one point of concentration that practices to go to an absorption state, I want you to listen to this. Bliss seems to be a big selling point when one considers practicing so strongly using absorption meditation. And many people today come to meditation for relief, primarily want to experience jhana in the form, this form simply to experience personal bliss and escape from the world. And one can get pretty addicted to this kind of bliss when unguided and uninformed, which can cause all sorts of relationship issues at home because bliss faces all the issues of any addiction causes in life. 
like we're talking drugs, we're talking alcohol and that kind of thing. Now this doesn't mean that monks can't, certainly doesn't mean that monks cannot practice one point of concentration. I'm not saying that, go for it, you know, and if that's what you wanna do, that's fine. And you go into absorption, that's fine. But with an untrained mind, this kind of bliss can be so mesmerizing that it could overtake an untrained, unwarned person without understanding that there is danger in craving and clinging like this. Although one can gain some knowledge about the dangers of severe craving for the bliss to keep happening. It's a, it's a defiant, I look at it as a defiant kind of thing. They want to defy or deny Anicca because they want to have bliss, 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 bliss. That's what I really want is bliss. And after that, give me bliss. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, that's kind of it, you know. Craving, clinging, and reacting to disturbances that can happen. Um, they start reacting to any kind of disturbance that happens when they go home from a retreat. And while in such a jhana, one cannot see, hear, smell, taste, or touch at all. I can hit you with a piece of wood or a two by four on your shoulder or ring a bell right beside your ear without any reaction at all because your aggregates are dysfunctional. No reaction can take place in a deep trance state of absorption meditation. However, if one makes a sound and such a meditator hears a noise, uh, the noise you made, they could come out and get really angry at you for the interruption. I mean really angry, because you pulled them away from what? You took away their bliss. And you will witness, you can witness a person whose equanimity, what this means is this is a person whose equanimity and their concentration, their mindfulness and their concentration are out of balance, out of balance. They're not balanced according to the seven factors of awakening. They're out of balance. That's why they get really mad, you see, um, and not balanced at all. It is possible, now watch, it is possible that the declared separation of serenity and insight practices, the Samatha and Vipassana, began because of this kind of situation or, or conundrum. If it happened on the history line, I was told by one historian that, you know, this happened along the way, and that's why the split happened, where they separated the two pieces. Thus, the comprehension needed to assist reaching Nibbana does not happen. And although there can be relief felt during retreats of that type, when the person goes back into life, they really can be disturbed, irritable, even grumpy and mean to people. So they don't break. So we have an advantage this, that happens when I show you the line of development for for um, the just the breathing meditation as an example, and and the Brahma Viharas. The difference is the biggest difference is that you can't use the breathing meditation for the solution to things that are situations that you get into with people in life. However, when you're dealing with the Brahma Viharas, just the way Deepa has experienced and uh, other students have experienced, when you're doing the loving kindness, there's no ill will. When you're practicing the Karuna, it compounds and, the, and then what happens is cruelty, thoughts of cruelty stop. They just don't come up in your mind. And then when you keep going, keep it going with a smile and keep it going, keep it growing. Okay, the mudita, it cancels out any discontent about anything. They say, well, you know, you can't have your desk here anymore. You have to put it in the closet now. We cleared out the utility room so you can have it down there in the hall. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> the head of oncology at this big hospital I worked for, his office was inside an old utility closet. It was fantastic. And he told me a story just like that. You know, he didn't care. He is so busy taking care of cancer patients and treating them. I don't care where you put me. Just, I don't want anybody to get in my stuff so the utility closet is perfect and I get to lock it. He just loved it. So when you find any texts that are talking about such a thing as fear of jhana, you must be able to differentiate what kind of jhana supports path development with parallel 
comprehension of the Dhamma as described in the text, and which kind does not. Because if they were reading the text, they would have figured out that these things weren't there. Sitting in bliss was like a forbidden thing. It was one of the distractions you find in uh, number 128 in the Upakalesa Sutta. You know, really being lustful and really wanting this to happen again and again the same way in your meditation. And how many times have I told you every single meditation is different? Every single one. So don't expect them to be the same. So that's what I wanted to throw in. So the what was written about fear of the jhanas was writ, if it's sitting in the text someplace is not referring to this practice. And why would so many people say that that's real is because they never considered looking very, very closely at the Anupada Sutta the way we have and actually taking it on its word just to see whether that is this is a possible thing what happened to Sariputra and when you approach the Anupada Sutta when somebody says well that's not possible that can't happen and you ask them what's your background oh I've been doing one point of concentration and absorption for 25 years and you know what it's not possible for that person to experience what he experienced in the Anupada Sutta and he could go away and sit and try and do it for months if he doesn't have the proper guidance, he would not experience what Sariputta experienced because of how the mind is trained like this. And for Sariputta's mind was operating like this. It was open and it was calm and it was feeding the idea of, of equanimity. Totally a different thing. Okay. So next question here. Do we have, Bunt, uh, Bunty, do we have any questions that came in that were listed? Uh, he's not there right now. Okay. So here's a question is, what was the purpose of the of Buddha Gautama's search? Well, basically to fully understand suffering, the cause of it, the cessation of it, and the way to the cessation of suffering. And he wanted to find that, then he wanted to be able to give that to as many people as he possibly could. This is the simplest way to talk about this, okay? And what was his purpose in doing the meditation? He used the meditation as his personal tool for deeper observation to find the answers to his questions, the Four Noble Truths. And then he developed a program for the common man or woman to become able to see how things work to the point where they automatically stop reacting and they start responding in life. The reason I'm saying this is because he's also not just known as the greatest meditation teacher in, on earth, maybe in, in, to me he's that way, but he's also a remarkable stories preserved of how he was a peacemaker. He was a peacemaker among villages and groups of people and military commanders and kings and merchants who were fighting and all kinds of council problems in cities. He was there as he appears in the stories to be a peacemaker. What did Buddha Gautama actually find? And you know, anytime during this thing, I probably should ask if anybody has any questions, they need to pipe up and say hello <laughs> or something and ask a question while I'm doing this. Okay, what did Buddha Gautama actually find? He found out, number one, what suffering is, the cause, the cessation, and a way for the people to experience it. He found that. Number two, he found a way to end all the suffering for good, meaning stop the wheel of samsara completely. Hypothetically speaking, he, um, the reason I'm saying hypothetically speaking, he did that is because we note the percentage, we have historians who concentrate just on the history and everything that's been preserved. A lot of times we'll tell you based on the population about 4% of the population at the time in the golden period, the highest period, become monastics, okay? 
And then about 1% of that 4%, that's not a lot, 1% of that 4% became the meditators and became the arahats and everything. And they were working really hard towards the arahatship. Not everybody was going through a tunnel with just the purpose of arahatship. This is one of the things you have to look at. Uh, how, he also discovered how to help people. The third one is how to learn enough of what he was teaching to relieve their suffering um, so much in daily life activities. And that's what a lot of you are experiencing. It's easier to teach children music. It's easier to work with my parents. It's easier to put up with my kids. I hear it all around me when you're starting to do this. If you keep using what we're telling you about the smile and uplifting and countering, your brain is starting to get to a place where it says, oh, wow, that is more comfortable if I help you smile and I help you to uplift yourself instead of criticizing, arguing, debating, more than debating, <laughs> and having troubles and saying, oh, I wish this would just get finished. When's it gonna get finished? You know it's going to get finished because of our friend, Anicca. And then the last one was over 45 years, he develops a way for humanity to see exactly how war happens and how peace works. This is a critical thing. I am, wish that I was still connected with different legislatures that I worked with and, and could still go there and say, you know, what's missing in your peace conference is breaking out into groups and trying to look very closely at human cognition to understand how does war work. And nobody can actually make ground, make advancement across the world with peace as for human beings. Like I was discussing something with someone yesterday and saying, you see, even when we talk, we talk about the rights for this group, the rights for that group, and we have to belong in a group. It's not even enough that we may be different colors in our races. That's not the only problem. We have different religions. We have different cars. And you know, one of the worst things that ever happened on the face of the earth, we have different phones. <laughs> and you can laugh about it, but they don't all work the same way. And that's just stupid because they're supposed to be communication for humanity and they don't work the same way. There's no code that says, you have just the same icons or you have to do it the same way. And you get a phone like, this is a prototype. This is something I got in Thailand with my, when I, my phone broke and it was a prototype. I let, I got talked into this and I thought it was a good idea because it was less expensive, but I opened the door to prototypes for, there's no end to it, no end at all. There's not just 50 buttons, there's gotta be 150. And it just wants me to do all kinds of stuff and changes its programs to see if I like, after I finally know the button is blue and it's round, they give me a square one that's pink or orange. I, I don't get it, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but that's communication. And the one thing the whole human race needs right now is communication. And you can't, you cut off the, uh, you not only used to complain about gender division or color division, how about communication division? You cut off the elders from understanding what's happening with the development of computers. And I've told some people the best thing we could do about that is to set up a service so everybody could rent a nine-year-old. Because if you could rent a nine-year-old, you would, you would solve the problem of the generation gap and the young person would be able to, the, 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 the adult would be really listening closely to the young person because the young person knows everything, <laughs> everything. They know how to fix the computer, they know how to fix the phone, they know how to do everything in your house. You see, so why not, you know, have a service where nine, why would we make them go and cut the grass and trim the edge to make money? Give, give them a little bit of money, you know, but what about grandpa who can't even make a phone call and get his email now anymore and doesn't know what his grandchildren are doing? And they never tell you. They never tell you they don't know. They're too proud. 
but they don't know, <laughs> you know? And all of a sudden next week, it's okay because next week I won't know. <laughs> you see, and I'll have to start all over again. So it's kind of crazy. The effect of, um, this is the, what did the Buddha Gautama find that affected governments and armies and merchants and lay people? The effect that comes from living a wholesome kind of and compassionate uh, lives in a kingdom. He gave governments and armies and merchants and people the option of living in peace instead of war. And he gave them the tools to accomplish this. He gave them an alternative for their life outcome. He showed them how they could control their own destiny by the, the power of decision. But he also taught them a practice that teaches you how there's a space there where there's an empty space and, oh, it's the spaciousness of mind. Yeah, the spaciousness of mind, those few minutes where you can make a decision if you're going to scream back at your mother or you're going to say, okay, fine, I'll do it, and then it will be done. You see? <laughs> so that's that's what he did and the story of the two generals in the valley between uh, Burma and Thailand is a wonderful story they were going to each had a an army of 5,000 people and they had their tents you know on the two peaks watching the next morning they were going to send 10,000 people to their death basically and um, so one counselor, he had an idea and he was a Buddhist and he said to them, you know, we don't have to do this. And they stopped having tea. They were having tea together the night before they were going to just go after each other, see. And um, the story goes that uh, the chancellor said, one of the chancellors said, why don't we don't go to war and not kill all these young men and they can go home and plant, you know, do their harvest. Why, why do we have to do it? And they said, we have no alternative. And he said, okay, what if you had a competition to build two towers instead of a, instead of a competition of killing each other? And they looked at him and said, what? Well, we'd have to stay in the valley for close to a year to do it, but each of the armies could build a pagoda and this the tallest and strongest one, we could get an observer to come in and decide which team won and whoever won got that valley, that piece of land. And they did it. And they decided not to go down and fight the next day. And that pagoda is still sitting there. It's in a valley between Burma and Thailand. My teacher went to see it. I just couldn't get over it. I thought it was great, you know? <laughs> it was wonderful. It was almost like saying, why don't we have two teams and play soccer instead? <laughs> you know, it was that close to being a soccer game. It was wonderful. And so this is how he, you know, came with this idea because he'd been practicing with the Buddha and studying with him. So ask yourself a question, what is my reason? This is an interesting one. We have people out here who are considering they want to be teachers for this practice. So ask yourself a question, what is my reason for practicing meditation today? Of course, all reasons are acceptable and in line with your life experience and what you decide to do when you come to practice meditation. But some reasons today are also promoted by some groups as like come and practice and they get in this thing about just to meet other people who practice meditation. And another one is everybody come for just reducing stress, relaxation of the body and the mind. Well, this is an accepted um, way uh, of, of treatment now for people with stress and depression and uh, tension and stress related things and it's very good there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that and if you do this uh, practice with using the Brahma Viharas it's excellent absolutely excellent one of the students has lost his back pain managing his skin condition a lot of things are changing for him because he's keeping his precepts and he's working the program really really well this is a good example of that that's happened 
experiencing calm for health reasons. That's the same thing. Look, learning to focus more on assignments for school and for work. A lot of people do that. Discovering more about the underdeveloped human potential. That's an, another reason people come to this because what happens, I, I was giving some talks um, in um, Sri Lanka to the organization that decides the rates on the money, the percentage rates on the money and everything. They had 80 people in their offices and um, they wanted to have more human potential open up for their people that worked there. And we, I did a training for four days and it was really excellent. They, it was really nice. Um, but they, it opens up the way when you calm down and you, you understand Nietzsche, Dukkha, Anatta, and you don't get so hyper about this is never going to end. This is never going to stop. And every time there's a crisis, when you look at the economics, they go, oh, here's another one. Oh, here's another one. You know, oh my gosh, it's happening to me. It's raining down. No, it's not happening when you, it, you need to be looking from a different perspective and say, I determine how I'm going to perceive what is happening. And then you see from there, that determines where you go. Yeah. Okay. And so you're more in charge of your destiny than you think you are. Finding out why life feels unbearably heavy and sometimes so confusing has to do with your perspective of life. If you believe that everything is happening to you, then it's going to be very, very heavy right now. But if you believe that actually it's up to you to paint the picture each day of what your life is, and how many times have I told you, go to an art store and get a plain, um, you know, canvas that's painted white and hang it on the wall. And in your mind, each day, you paint a picture of your day. And then at night, you imagine it's just erased. And it could look a number of different ways. You see? but it's your imagination game. So you have, why do you have this blank canvas by your, the door to your bathroom? It reminds me every morning I'm going to paint my day and I'm in charge. It's my day, <laughs> you see? Okay. How does everything actually work in our experience in life? That's one of the examples. We choose how we are going to see the world. Nobody tells us how we see the world. And there are certain things we need to relearn, like if somebody's yelling at you and picking on you, listen a little closer if you know the person, if they're part of your staff that you work with, if you've watched them for a period of time or you can watch them on a daily basis, watch how they uh, handle this. It's other workers or, or supervisors. But whenever anybody really picks on you, they're actually picking on themselves. And it's actually what they're saying is not being said to you, but is being their agonizing piece about themselves. There's something connected there. So you listen very carefully. And if that's true, why are you ruining your day by taking in what they're saying when you think they're talking about you, but actually they're talking a lot of times by, about themselves? Next one is the Buddha wanted to see how suffering worked and how to relieve it for the sake of compassion for all humanity again. He taught others how he discovered the true nature of everything and the question about untapped human potential comes up and he solved it. You need space in your mind. You need space. And if we painted a picture of our head before we're trained, we'd have the future and the past and this little tiny thing that's like today's world. <laughs> and this stuff is like pushing, like the blues are over here and maybe the hot oranges are over here in the future, pushing, pushing, and this little yellow line is in between and that's all you have. And then you practice meditation and this sort of falls off the head and this one disappears because you know, why should you worry about the future? You're not there yet. You don't know what it's going to be. And you know that all the energy about past events, they are finished, fixed, and done. So 
So why should you let this thing stick to your head? And this one stick to your head. It's like the science fiction movie of the blob. And here's the blue blob and the red blob, you know. <laughs> like that. And you can pull the stuff off and go, oh, wow, that's so neat. I have space. Now I can think of new sort of peaceful solutions, invent some that would solve the problem without hurting anybody's feeling and making other people happy. And that would be fun. The actual questions uh, we've about meditation as, as a practice, what is the object of meditation? Now this is important. We don't get a chance to talk about this very much. Okay, we don't do it too often. Okay, but I want you to think for a minute, what is the purpose of an object of meditation for a practice of meditation? What is the purpose of it? Anybody? Tell me what is the purpose of the object of meditation for your practice? Anybody? To recenter our mind, to recenter, to bring it back. That's right, to recenter it. Um, I, you know, I hesitate to use the word anchor, but people like anchor. If you understand anchoring, like an anchor, yeah, I can show you, well, I don't want to do that. But you have a boat, you know, like here's a boat. Here's a boat. Where's the boat? <laughs> where's the boat? Okay, where's the boat? Okay, you can use this guy. Here, this is a boat. This is a boat. And here's an anchor. And I put the anchor and it's sitting in the bay. And you're going to sleep in your boat tonight. And it's tied to this anchor. So the wind comes and the boat can move around, move around the anchor, but it stays there. See, it stays there, okay? You don't concentrate on the anchor because it's just there for you as a guidance system to the boat. So it doesn't float away on the tide. When we pull it into a bay and we wanna sleep in the boat, we have to have an anchor just to drift around like this and not get lost. That's one of the purposes. But if you think about it being an anchor and I have to concentrate on the anchor all the time, that's wrong. So what do you get out of an object of meditation? Does anybody know what you get out of it? <laughs> Can anybody think of something that you get out of your object of meditation? You're right. You don't get any information. It has nothing for you. This is the big deal about this object of meditation. It isn't meant for you to concentrate on it as a one-pointed concentration object. It's just there so that when you are pulled, you, you, it get flowed away, the attention, it has a place to come back and continue going straight. That's what we need to remember. It's only there for you to come back to. So the two terms is, it's there as my home base, like in baseball. You always come back to the home base, okay? It's my home base or it's my recentering point. That's what I want you to remember. And that's like a law for the, it's the object, it's the object law. Okay, the next one is how do I begin setting up a meditation practice for my life? People ask me that, okay? and. Choose a location. It doesn't have to be a big location. It doesn't have to be in an expensive resort. It doesn't even have to be in, in any place uh, particular. Wear loose clothing. Find a comfortable posture, position for practice without pain. This is key. If you're having pain, if you missed it, we have two kinds of pain, meditation pain and physical pain. How do you identify pain? When you get up and you start to take a walk, the pain disappears on the first two steps. That's a meditation pain. When you keep walking, your hip or your knee or your back or your neck, it still hurts. That's a physical pain. It needs to be corrected. And the way it gets corrected is through posture. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. 
um, you set up your timing for your place where you're meditating for at least 30 minutes to an hour for practice each day. That's minimum. 30 minutes, no less than 30 minutes. Any less than 30 minutes is like you're just taking a, a, a break from work or a pause in life, but it isn't anything constructive concerning your practice going deeper or seeing how things work at all. 30 minutes is the minimum that we can see. Now, there are what we call 40 minute wonders. <laughs> and what I mean by that is when a person practices only 30 minutes, if that's all they can do, they can reach the first jhana. But there are some people that are gonna turn up and it's a 40 minute mark. I don't understand it. But if I get them to sit 10 minutes longer, bang, now they start going down the path, just like that. So sometimes there is that situation, but 30 minutes is the minimum. I don't like to ask people for an hour when I do online retreats. In retreats that I teach one-on-one, -on -one, I would say to you, you need to be sitting a minimum of an hour and people do it. It's not hard because why? <laughs> because time is an illusion and it doesn't really exist at all. <laughs> time is an illusion. It's something trained into us in our civilization to keep track of things. We had to have time. But when you go toward the Aboriginal people somewhere around the world, you're going to find they get up the moment the sun rises. They work and all day until they might take a nap in the heat of the day from 12 to 1 o'clock or 12 to 2 o'clock but then they're working the entire day and they go to sleep when the sun goes down. So they're getting up very early and the early bird gets the worm or the early person catches the fish in the morning when they're eating in the morning, just before the sun rises. So these are the survival things are dictating. There wasn't time time. It was something more civilized groups wanted to keep track of something, you know, so the queen could say, I met my husband at three o'clock in the Rose Garden in London, just below the blue clock on the pink building with the lovely glass. And you see it was three o'clock, please put it in the history book. Okay, fine. But there's no such thing as time. Play with this and just say there isn't, there isn't anything. This can be a very tiny space that you set up. It needs to be comfortable with your own pillows and a place where you won't be disturbed. This can be a tiny place in houses if they have staircases. Make a deal with somebody, whatever is stored under the staircase, figure out a way to box it in get a, one of those really tiny little air conditioners, you know, the little box air conditioners, put it under the stairs and make yourself a hiding place like in the Harry Potter stories. Harry Potter was living underneath the staircase in the very first story. Under the staircase is not bad at all. There's a space for you to make a little altar and um, be by yourself. Now, the one thing about it is you need to learn a key rule at the very beginning. And I've heard this from so many people. I'm trying, but it's too noisy, too much noise. Well, I have to clue you in. You learn the basics about sounds before you begin practicing. The level of sound is flexible because you are to train your mind that a sound is just a sound. So that in the future, you will be able to sit anywhere. And I mean anywhere. And Bhante meant that when he was teaching me in the beginning, whenever we traveled, he put me in a train station and say, okay, we're gonna be here for an hour, sit. And he watched me sit. <laughs> sit in a train station, sit in the airport, sit in the middle of the traffic. Everybody else is in a traffic jam and you just sit. It doesn't matter. Sound always comes and arises, is there and it goes away. And what is it? It's only you taking it personally, you getting mad at it. It's all you. It isn't anything to do with anything else. It's me taking it personally. Okay. 
So let it go. Experiment with it. Just let it go. Why should we use the Brahma Viharas and start with metta for the meditation to have a strong meditation for life? We've already kind of said that in what we've been talking about because it has a counter base system, a contradiction system that works automatically, has been tested in research and people are beginning to figure it out now. Loving kindness cancels out ill will thoughts. Karuna cancels out thoughts of cruelty. Mudita cancels out any thoughts of discontent at all. Equanimity cancels out any aversion for anything, whether it's smells or feeling or touch or sound or sight. It doesn't matter, or temperature. You just don't get fussy about it anymore. The begin to apply when you're practicing the four steps of right effort anytime mind gets disturbed or distracted. Recognize an unwholesome distraction with tension and tightness that causes your attention to move away from the objective. Release the attention off the distraction and relax your head. Third, bring up a wholesome mind state, which is smiling is the fastest one. That's it, it works. To replace the imperfection that occurred as you return to your object of meditation. It's in this very smooth thing. You're doing this while you're doing this to come back. Just the way when you uh, release, then you relax. But they are two separate steps, but they can happen in a very nice flow. The whole thing, all of this, recognize, release, relax. Smile as you come, re-smile as you return and repeat this whole thing, but not the repeat part, but all the five parts of it, okay, happen in two seconds. That's how fast. So, you know, I don't want to hear people come to me and say, okay, I let it go. Uh, let's see, this arose, and the first thing I did was I, I sat with that. They'll say, I sat with that. With what? <laughs> was it your spiritual friend you sat with? No, I sat with the distraction that came up. I hear them say, I sat with, I, I went, I sat with the distraction or paused with the distraction. That's all of these. I paused with it. I sat with it. I met with it and said, where'd you come from? And where did you live? When, how'd you get here? Whatever you degree, you did this. Okay. However you did it. That's called, I engaged the enemy. <laughs> I engaged. Okay. What am I talking about? Look at Majima Nikaya number 22 in section six. And the, the monk has a problem in the sutta. The monk has a problem. He believes it's okay to go and sit with the, the visitor. Okay? He believes it is okay. Okay. And then the Buddha comes and he says, oh, no, no, you got this all wrong. At which case the monk, he sat silent, dismayed, with his shoulders drooping and his head down glum without a response to the Buddha. He was like, oh, I got it wrong. And then the Buddha comes back and the Buddha says, okay, um, misguided man, he says to the monk, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct you if you engage in them? You hear that? That's basically an order. Don't engage. Do not engage. You're all on course. You're ready to go down. <laughs> Do not move. Do not engage. Cut and dry. Why? because you are food. <laughs> you are nourishment for the hindrance, if you pay attention to it. Then he says, I have stated sensual pleasures, provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and the danger in them is still more. If you pay attention to it, you've turned it into a point of gratification and that sets sensual pleasure. I'm curious and I'm gonna go see it. 
I don't want to hear it anymore. Do not engage the hindrance. It has nothing for you. We told you that before. And don't feed it. And give it dessert once in a while. Just, but that's all. <laughs> okay. Okay. Repeat the cycle as needed when your attention moves away. Next one. What supports your meditation most to keep it going smoothly? Now, I'm going to show you something. We've done this before, but this is basically, I look at thinking about it and this kept coming up. So I did it this way. There are five faculties that you must learn to balance your practice. You get to know the five faculties first to support the continuation of your practice. So first you meet and greet them. The five faculties are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. In order to remember that, say femqua, femqua, three times, femqua, <laughs> F-E-M-C-W, femqua, sounds French, okay. Faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Now, faith in the instructions as the Buddha left them. Number one, faith that they will still work today if we follow them, if we follow them alone, without anything else, precisely. That's the trick. Energy, keeping up the energy in your body is important to keep your sitting going long enough to see deeply and clearly how does the suffering work. That's why the energy is important. Mindfulness, learning to balance your observation power, reminding us to use the six R's whenever needed and reminding us to do all of the steps the same way every time because you are retraining mind and that's how you retrain a mind. You do it that way and then that way and you don't do it this way. No, nope, you do it that way and you go that what this way. Okay, no, this way. <laughs> and if you keep doing that, Mind goes, I think she's trying to tell me something. I think I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> That's what happens finally. Concentration. Learning to establish a productive level of a collected mind for the best observation to occur. That's the best way to say that. Wisdom. Taking in the gradual teaching to develop a gradual practice and attain gradual knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is also involves learning dependent origination, but here we, we can add in here two other aspects uh, that we need to manage, which are curiosity and persistence. They're not listed as seven factors. They're not listed there, okay? But you have to have curiosity to keep your interest up. Curiosity, interest, and persistence. There's actually three of them. And that's how you keep the investigation going. So they're components of investigation. You see what I'm saying? Now, what are we trying to understand by witnessing our meditation? Well, the very precise version of this, and I love this because every time I go fishing around in the Majima Nikaya now, I find these five pieces from 148, I find them again and again and again. And like I found them in the front of the book just a couple of days ago in below, it was below the number 10 on the sutta list. And I couldn't believe they're sitting there and they're in there probably in five, maybe seven different suttas, not just appearing in 148. But these five pieces are what you're trying to train yourself to understand. The origination, that means the true nature of all arising phenomena, the impersonal nature of it. The second one is the disappearance, the true nature of all disappearance of phenomena. How does it arise? How does it pass away? The third one is gratification. How do I personally like sensual pleasures, get involved with them, gratification? And that's how the dependent origination is working, okay? danger of the whole thing, the danger of not understanding these, how one gets pulled away from the present time. And what did we say about the present time? 
The present time is the only place that you are alive, the only place. You're not alive in the future, it's not here. You're not alive in the past, it's all gone. You're right here, that's it. That's the alive place. The practice reveals when you practice it, you uncover the Four Noble Truths, the phenomenological dependent origination or human cognition, and the three characteristics of existence become perfectly clear how they work and why they're important. We know the Four Noble Truths. We know dependent origination. We've talked about it because we get to see and realize. It's important because we get to see and realize the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. We need a song. We need a song. <laughs> The origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape from the suffering. We need a wrap. We need a wrap here for this. Okay. We can, we can learn this ourselves and begin using the escape that the steps gave us in right effort on one level day to day. Um, day to day in life. We, in other words, I'm saying for the calm, anybody, anybody, Buddhist, anybody can relieve the suffering in just a few days. If you start applying this practice the right way, three characteristics, it just tells you what they are in each Dukkha and not. Yep. Time uh, update. One and a half hours is. Okay. We are going to do, this is the last piece. I think this is the last piece right here. Okay. What are you moving towards when you practice your meditation? Now, of course, we mentioned, and I didn't do a lot of writing here, but why did you come to learn meditation? So people are going for different types of goals, obviously, today when they're coming to learn, if you're going to be a teacher. But along the way, you can experience mundane experiences of relief like little mundane nibbanas that are happening and it's like an opening and then you feel this and maintain it for hours into work and then you come back out it fades away and then you might have it happen again once you learn how it feels like you get more familiar with it till finally it just turns off and you have an experience of the actual mundane nibbana and uh on the way there while practicing Twim, we journey through eight aware levels of understanding called jhanas. And these are mentioned many, many times in the text, but they're not mentioned as levels, a particular understanding with factors that are present in this one, and then we these are gone, and then it'll then go to the next. So if you have the list already of the Anupada Sutta, the, the tracking picture, the, the chart, you can read and understand what comes and goes in each one. The Anupada Sutta gives us the most comprehensive account of a journey through these levels of the Buddha Dhamma, and it explains each one parallel to our meditation development. The Dhamma and comprehension and the, the practice happening at the same time. The causal state which supports our falling into cessation level eight depends on our awakening factors coming into balance and our comprehension has to be aligned with our development. So basically this is, un, this is revealing to us if we're, if we're guiding people that people who are not keeping up with their comprehension um, as they are learning the, the meditation itself are not going to have the support to maintain anything in life. It's like they'll visit us and go back and visit us and fall back and visit us and fall back. And we had one person went like maybe 15 years like that. And finally it hit him all of a sudden that you know, I don't retain this stuff. I don't know why. And then he put it together. He figured it out. Okay, now this is a little hard to read the way it turned out. But so if we were to picture the practice now by considering the helpful faculties, the faith, energy, mindfulness, collecting wisdom, faith in instructions, energy, curiosity, persistence, and you could say interest there too. Um, mindfulness is observation power. Collectedness is the productive level of your concentration or collectedness. 
your wisdom is the precepts and the knowledge of hindrance management and the dependent origination, those pieces, how that's what's going to support you. So without the comprehension, you don't have support and it's simple. You cannot go through, you, you have to have a relative level of understanding with this. So what this was supposed to be was a chart for the whiteboard. So if you wanna, I'll show you how it works. Those are the pieces and then you would put them at the top of the page and draw a little arrow down and the next line would be, as we know five faculties better, we slowly attain the knowledge and wisdom we need. Then another little line, it says we begin to see with comprehension, not just hear it, but we begin to see it. You see, the thing is, I can tell you something and you hear it and you can write it and say it and you might know it, okay? But to learn it, in, internally learn it, I have to involve you. You have to be involved to make it functionally happen in his way of teaching. Godema's way of teaching was knowledge and vision, which becomes the foundation for knowledge and wisdom. The next one, the comprehension flows into, we watch to see how everything works. That's your dependent origination. Next one is, this builds up confidence. And a lot of confidence comes up in that. And your anatta training also. And then we abandon all fears. We really start abandoning fears. We're not afraid of people coming to yell at us anymore. Now we know how it works. You know, um, We send a message to their mother now. <laughs> Okay, next one is this brings up balance. When we abandon our fears, all of a sudden our equanimity makes a jump and gets stronger. And then that makes a more open mind. And then that clears the way for major insights to come up. As you're comprehending the text, you will start to notice if you listen to a sutta, maybe four times over a few weeks, you hear different things coming from it. This is how you are growing your insights because you heard that sutta the first time you ever heard it, you only heard it as a beginner. And after you get this far down the chart, you hear it again, you get something else and then so forth, okay? And then clearly realizing the seven factors, the bojanga, um, understanding those seven factors and then you learning not you knew them maybe just know them from hearing me say what they are now you realize that you're using some of them and then you start to balance them as you wonder how what it'll be like if i balance them and when you get to nothingness seems to be the area of nothingness and before you go into neither perception non-perception that's a different thing but uh it seems to be between uh, infinite consciousness and nothingness, it's those two areas, that you have time to balance the Bojanga. And it's like you are balancing, okay, and the last one is neither perception or non-perception, and then you fall into cessation, then you happen to have the experience of, of, of Nibbana, okay. When you are balancing the enlightenment factors, what is this like? And way to show you is it's like this. I wish I had a white one. I don't have a white one. Do I have a yellow one in it? Here. This is a yellow one. It shows up better. So I have a balancing bar and I am walking on a tightrope. And tightropes are really actually those tightropes are about like, they're about like that big. They're not like my finger. They really are about this big when they're put up. And when you walk on those, you don't walk like this. You walk like this, actually. It appears to the audience you're walking more like this, but actually you're walking like that over the type rope. But you can fall, obviously. <laughs> so when they have these big long bars, you know, you have to, you're walking the type rope to see if you can it's going like this, you've got to lean this way. And this way, you've got to lean that way, right? To be a balance on the, on the tightrope. And so the play, the play with the balancing bar and pretend you're crossing over the chasm that was inside the, the, um, 
the cave, the, the, uh, the, the great big cave in um, the last crusade with uh, Harrison Ford. And he couldn't get to the knights that had the, the chalice cup, you know, the Holy Grail. He couldn't get across there because he couldn't find the path across the chasm. Remember that? Okay, well, he was lucky because once he saw it, that was like this wide and he could walk across. But he said, uh, this is a tightrope and you're walking, you have to pay attention to where you're going, just where you're going and remember all the factors that are here. So this mindfulness is holding the tightrope, the, the, the balancing bar, and you have to get across with it like this. Now, you see the shape of this uh, is not like a key, like normally you'd have a key and I would put it in the door and turn it. But to get into, uh, through nothingness and fall into the last level of your, uh, that you have to go through, to fall into that last level, that last state at the doorway, get through it. It's like a door, you have to unlock it. And just pretend this is the key and the key goes in a slot and then you turn it and you fall. You see, this is the image I can give you about that, it's like a simile. And then when you're in that last state, you have to go back. We have to show you the text to show you where it came from, but also the, the, um, the um, what am I trying to say? The main commentary, Buddhaghosa's commentary actually describes it fairly well, because in the last state that you go through before you fall into a cessation, there's nothing there. There was not that there was nothing. There was nothing and nothing, okay? Nothingness has nothing there. And that's why this is a good exercise for you to just be quiet and stay in there and just try balance to see if you can get it just right and fall. When you go in the last state, well, that's a real trip because you'll sit in your meditation and you've been sitting for two or three hours or two or three or four hours at this point and you're pretty steady that way and you come into your interview and you say i it's the craziest thing i don't know if i actually sat or whether i slept it's confusing to you you don't know what you did but then we'll tell you to take a walk and when you take a walk you are to will tell you you are to recall in your mind, tell your mind, I want to recall what happened in that sitting. And you just keep walking and listen to what happens or see inside what happened. And the moment you see something or remember something, I remember there was a blue light, you six R. No questions, no involvement, no analysis, you, you six R. And then next thing is I saw line patterns that were lines like this. I saw, pat okay, 6R. Next, next thing pops up. You would say something, you know, the same thing. Just 6R, 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 6R. What are you doing? You are emptying the cup completely. Absolutely, completely emptying the cup so that you're preparing yourself for what happens when you go into cessation, okay? And we won't go into that today. Okay, any questions on any of these questions so far? Anybody? Hello? I see Deepa. So, yeah, so what you just mentioned, uh, is there a way to even train the mind while we are sleeping at night? Um, What's happening to you with sleep patterns when you're practicing, you know, towards that is your sleep hours diminish. They just diminish away, okay? So you're sleeping very little where you were sleeping, say, eight hours before. And as you start practicing to actually uh, use the path and the intention is to, you know, to reach uh, that level, you can... Um, set yourself up to go to sleep but you don't want to think at all so 
you, the way you allow the whole thing to be natural, like with nature, you would lie down in the bed and say, okay, to the brain, it's time to sleep. You sleep right away though, right away you go. And this is actually, do you remember when, you remember when I gave you the um, people to work on, right? The other people, remember? Yes. Do you remember what I said to you about what that was actually for? I told you it was a trick. You're trying to check your brain, mark him, like give him an exam to see whether if I use these other kinds of people, will my mind do the same thing I have trained it to do with one spiritual friend? That's what we were testing. Remember I told you that? Yes. That's really what that's for. And it is in the commentary. It was preserved to do that. But only that way, the way I showed you, not with groups of people, that doesn't work, but it's trying to test to see, I call it the dog trick. <laughs> Did the dog learn the dog trick, the brain, you know? And will it do it again and do it again and do it again? Whether it's a black person, white person, yellow person, big person, red person, doesn't matter. Whether it's a male or a female or a man on the moon or a disabled person, a beautiful person, an ugly person, will it do it? And that's what you were testing, okay. When you go to sleep, you can use this for incredibly good sleep by just learning to lie down at night and say, okay, go to sleep. And you can also tell your brain one other thing. You say, go to, before, we, I will go to sleep and I will wake up smiling. Now, go to sleep. And you go to sleep. See? When you wake up, you will wake up fresh and you will smile and you'll notice there's no normal. Well, my kids freaked out. I visited my kids and you know, growing up with me, the rule of the house was do not talk to mother in the morning unless she has her coffee. <laughs> and so they didn't know what was wrong with me because I went to visit one of them and I just got up, you know, and I was just fine and happy as a lark. You see, they didn't understand. My daughter came to visit me. She didn't know what was wrong with me too when she came to visit me that one time. So, yeah. So you you can you can, can your mind will continue. It will it will stop. It will rest. Okay. Um. You uh. You're, one of the interesting things in sort of in reference to this is suppose you were somebody who stopped your practice for four months and then came back and you wondered if you could and I would say just sit down and start with the directions and start from there and and what will happen you were in the seventh or eighth and you just said I'm done and I'm not gonna do it for five. you come back what happens is it starts in the uh, the point, at almost probably in the fourth jhana, sending to the directions. It remembers that right away, and it'll do it. Okay, then it'll go into space, infinite consciousness, nothing to back, and you're there. It's tumbling. So this tells us, and sometimes you can sit longer than you did before at all when you when you come back. So what does that mean? It means we're turning something on inside that was never turned on and we didn't turn it off. We just walked away and took a break. We didn't tell the mind anything and it's still developing, quietly developing. It's like we turned a river on inside of us that we cannot say stop the river now because it's very slowly learning how to completely open up. And it's up to you if you're willing to put aside the imperfections of the world that preoccupied you and you will allow this to develop. But that river is going to even just drip. It is going to not go away. It's not gonna be a drought. You might think it is or be afraid of it for till you realize it keeps moving, see? And so at those levels, it's really true that you can come back and you're fine. I don't know about sleep. Bunty, what's your experience with sleep? 
Bunty Dama Gavesi. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I don't know. How about you, Ardiko? What's your experience with that? <laughs> Bunty Dama Gavesi. Wait, okay. Tell me, do, do you ever, did you ever train yourself while you were asleep? Train myself, uh, not uh, uh, in the dream thing, but uh, I used to do that. Uh, there was another other, uh, practice I was doing. Yeah, but I was thinking, <laughs> in, I was thinking deeper in the sense of, okay, you will remain calm for the night. That's a form of training and seeing how much your mind is willing to communicate with you. Once you go through the, the level of the other people, you realize what I said to you. It's like the mind really understands how to do this. So now you know you have opened, you have a phone to your mind. <laughs> you see, so now you know at nighttime you can say, practice being calm in equanimous all night. And I'll wake up in the morning with a smile. Now go to sleep. So does this mean that there won't be any dreams? Because there, there is... Dreams will, dreams will stop, pretty much. They eventually stop. Um, you know, if you're not practicing, they might come back some, but they don't ever come back really forcefully with people that I've talked to about that. Um, they might have had really bad time before. Um, but they don't come back forcefully, but they might come back some, you know. And that was good news for one person in Russia because we taught her how to stop sleepwalking. <laughs> she stopped sleepwalking. We did that in four days. But, but she did still have restlessness sometimes unless she did what we told her to do, okay? She had to do the Arahan, you know, the Iti Piso, Arahan. Samasam Buddha, we taught her that. She had to do that. The other thing was if she got the feelings like she had the urge, she could sit up in bed and just go Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. She could do that. Or she could recite uh, the one about the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sat, three gems. There's a recitation. She could do that. But the, but the simplest one was just to get her to pick up her beads and do the Arahan, Samasam Buddha, Vijicharana Sampano, to do that one, okay, the nine qualities of the Buddha. But she said that if she stopped doing that before bed, she would get restless, but she wouldn't sleepwalk anymore, which delighted her husband. He really got some rest, <laughs> you know, because he had to follow her around. And they did tell us before they came to the retreat that this was there. And she was walking around the property and then coming back to the building. It's kind of weird. There was an interesting group of people, <laughs> but it, it worked. It helped her. Okay. Anybody else? Question? Yeah, Ardika. So, sister, does that actually has anything to do with a, a past experience or um, like habitual tendency or something that um, like traumatic event or it's just... Wait, it was sleepwalking, you mean? The yeah. Sleepwalking? Yeah, is, is that, how is it? How is that even possible, actually? I don't know, but I know something. If you were to talk to Brenda, uh, she would probably tell you she's worked with people to stop sleepwalking, and you should ask her that question because she has more information on it than I do. Yeah, she does. She has good information about that. All right. Good source. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Ulysses. Um, let me go first. Okay. You're going, yes? Oh, who's, who's going? Let me go first. Okay. Ulysses is going, but you have to um, put your, your mute. No, no. I said let me king go first. That's what I said. <laughs> oh, me king? Oh. I'm sorry. I thought you said let me go first. I said, okay. <laughs> This is great. That's <laughs> okay. My, my name is very confusing. Um, I'll make it quick. Um, suppose, oh. uh, mm -hmm. suppose I want to 
talk about the origination, disappearance, gratification, danger, and escape of all phenomena to um, a seven or nine-year-old, how would I do that? I have one, uh, okay. I, I have one example I, I always give. Now, seven-year-old's a little young, but nine-year-old is fine, nine, ten-years well, old. Sure. I can give one example for a seven-year-old. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that is uh, with an ice cream. Say there is no ice cream. That is the, and the ice cream comes. That is uh, origination. The dissipation is the uh, finishing of the ice cream. Uh, the gratification is you enjoy the ice cream. The danger is that the ice cream is impermanent. So it go goes, if it starts, you start eating it, it gets finished. The escape is the eightfold path. It is like six hours. Uh, we can say yeah. that uh, eightfold path where it uh, shows us how to get away from the cycle of all the gratification and the danger. So this is the, uh, I think, the easier version. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I help. Uh, what if we want to explain it to someone, uh, a, a kid who knows nothing about Buddhism, so doesn't know anything about Eightfold Path or so you can uh, see that that is what uh, we are saying that uh, if you want to put the last step, the last step is the eightfold path. What you can say is uh, uh, you can put it in the six hours that you have a, a, a opportunity to understand uh, that this process is impersonal. And thus, uh, you should not uh, be uh, kind of attached to uh, anything because everything has a uh, inherent property that it will get over. Like an ice cream is there, you like it. The, uh, uh, when you are uh, liking it, till that time you can like the ice cream. But when it is getting over, you have to realize that that is the nature of things that everything gets over. So you should not be attached. So that that kind of kind of you can uh, think of a kind of a uh, appropriate simile for that. Seven years old, don't use attached, use hold on. Hold on to something. You can't hold on to something, okay? Don't hold on to things because everything changes. Everything changes, yeah. Attached, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way, okay? Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, sister. And Okay, May had a question. Do you want to speak to that question now? She's okay, the, the one. The other that... question you should ask about the Sati Pithana. Uh, uh, Sati Pithana question. Oh. Yeah, the Bhante uh, has a very simple, uh, that is Bhante Vimal Ramsi has a very simple uh, explanation for Sati Pithana. So Sati Pathana Sutra means that you are mindful or you are aware of what you have to uh, yeah, uh, when, yeah, when tell you them. Pithana. Can you? When you are doing your activities, so wait, uh, we're getting if you are walking. Wait, 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 wait. We uh, we had a bad connection. We we have a bad connection, but you have to say the question before we do it because they don't know the question. So okay, you want me I, to? Read? I'll read the. Shall I read the question? Um. Wait. I, I know it's here. Um. Oops. Peep, peep yourself, right? <laughs> okay. Here was like, okay, the question was, um, how do we um, contemplate mind objects as mind objects? In, in the Satipatthana Sutta, it talks about this. In terms of five aggregates, when affected by clinging, seven enlightenment factors, four noble truths, etc., and abide contemplating these mind objects both internally and externally in our practice day to day at work and in home life. Um, maybe we can work on a practical day to day example where we can use throughout the day so that when we have a formal sitting, the contemplation then goes into automatic mode. How does it work? So but I asked Bonte to explain it because when I talked to him, my explanation was about two pages long and his was about two sentences long. <laughs> this is, uh, so I, I asked him. <laughs> so 
So this is what uh, Mantai women right. see normally talks in his uh, uh, Dhamma uh, Desanas he gives after the uh, retreat. So uh, normally what happens is uh, we are uh, considering sat Satipatthana as being awareness uh, which we bring for our daily activities. Now, uh, what slow, slow. Is, uh, a little bit slow. Is, is that when walking, you are aware of walking. Okay? So yeah. what are you aware of? Uh, so you are aware of how your mind's attention is moving from one thing to another. So that is uh, that if you have a thought, that is a mind object. If you, there is a thought. So you are aware that the thought has come and uh, how it is taking your attention away from what you are doing. So even when you are walking, uh, you are aware that the how the mind's attention is moving from one place to another. So what you do is when you recognize your mind attention is moved, what you do is you recognize and you release and then you relax, re-smile and return to your task. So in this way, you keep your mindfulness going uh, when you are doing your daily activities. So whatever you are doing, that becomes your uh, uh, target or whatever is uh, what you call object of meditation. Okay. So if you are reading, then reading is your object of meditation. But you are aware how your mind's attention is moving from your reading. You recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return. So this is how uh, Bhante is explaining that you can use this Satipatthana. It is a very simple instruction. It is not a very complicated instruction uh, which the Buddha is giving. That you right. are just aware of how your mind's attention is moving. If you are right. sitting, you are aware that you are sitting. But uh, where is your awareness going? It is going to the attention of how your mind attention is moving from one thing to another. Which interestingly is also the definition of uh, mindfulness. That you remember to observe how your mind's attention moves from one thing to another. And, and how this, this process is impersonal. Yeah, this is what we started in the very beginning when we were talking tonight. Um, I think I mentioned in the beginning tonight, I don't know if we were recording or not, <clears throat> that one thing about the way that we're teaching you is like we're teaching you like with an Olympic coach. Like uh, it's a higher, it's a, an advanced level of understanding. I mean, I've had some elder monks uh, actually said to me one time in this center, what you're teaching is very precise, is absolutely correct, and usually is only taught to monks. In other words, why are you teaching this to lay people was what he was saying. But... Bhante, the thing is, like, Bhante and I have been confronted with this by sometimes elder Burmese monks and elder Thai monks. But we're trying to say it's very easy for people to understand if you can speak to them at their level with simple words and explain what all of this was about. There's no reason to keep dependent origination away from people. You see, I was criticized for for, um, I don't know what exactly happened in that story, but uh, I was being uh, criticized, Bhante, I guess, was being criticized for teaching a woman is what they said. Why did you teach this woman this? And then I watched him to see what he was gonna say, because I was over here, and when he, what he said was brilliant, because he said, I taught her because she can understand it. And then that left him cold. The monk had nothing to say after that. He could not say anything else. But the point is that when you're talking about Satipatthana, for instance, what remember I said to you, when we do Vipassana and everything, we're talking more about the body than we're talking about what's happening in the mind. And when we reevaluate the Satipatthana to retune your understanding so it works well with this practice very, very well. That's what Bhante Damagavesi just explained. When I'm walking, there's no need for me to try to watch my feet constantly and look at the arising and falling of the foot. But what is a higher level of understanding is what's happening in my mind while I am walking. Because why? because mind is the command center. Mind is the forerunner of all states, not just from the mental aspect,
but from the physical body. Mind is the, 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 the command center for running you. You see, if, if Ingrid falls down and she hurts her body, I might not be able to, to um, stop the pain of the body by talking to you about the body and sitting and feeling it, but I could stop and give you a lot of relief if I remembered to tell you to let go of it in your head and send, meta, send mindful uh, meta to your body and, and just send some to your body and then keep going with what you're doing. I tell you the story when the tree fell on me, that was a big tree, that was not a little tree. And I'm laying there and I, all this pain, but then what came to me was, well, I don't need to be hyper scared and everything. What I need to do is remember everything that I was taught for the last two years and, and think in my head, I don't want to envision. I was getting in trouble very quickly under that tree. What if I can't walk? What if I can't drive? What if I can't go see my kids again? Oh my, for about three seconds, maybe a half a minute, I was going crazy like that. And then I would look at this, look at this, how fast it happened. Just like that. All of a sudden, just into projection, worthless projection, nothing to do with what was essential at the time, nothing to do with that. And I only had a few seconds to do it. I would go unconscious and come back and unconscious and come back. And, and then I, when I came back, I would, what am I going to do? Okay. They, one person, you got me sort of in this fix. <laughs> they went to get the monk and they'll come back. You see? Not much you can do when you're pinned down by a tree. But the point was, there wasn't a, a fear was really there initially, and then fear just went because I remembered something. I remembered what fear was. How did the fear, how does it work? And where are these ideas coming from? That was coming from when I was in a wheelchair and I couldn't walk and we didn't know what was going to happen with my legs in Washington from some other time. It was just come up just like that. Just the same situation. I could tell you that's exactly where it came from. Reached in the file, pulled it out and applied it to being under the tree. All the fear thing. You see? Does it, does it answer? Huh? Does it answer your question that um, I was asking? In the in the simplest sense, yes. I think where I got a bit confused was when I was reading the suttas, and then it said like um, observing the mind object. Oh, actually, I want to read it. Observing mind object, um, mind. I can read the mind second. object, both internally and externally, and then. Um, um, oh, sorry. I need to find. Okay, look at it this way. What I went back and looked at that and I said, okay, so what's actually happening there if we were to talk about the internal and the external? Okay, oh, where is it? What page is it on? Wait, a buddy. Um, Sutta number. Yeah, it's number 10. It's number 10. Go to 150, page number 50. 150. Contemplation of the mind, okay? Now, all right, let me point out something when Bhante teaches this sutta, okay? Yeah, okay, let me do it this way. When Bhante teaches this sutta, he does not teach the insights section of the sutta. It's not part of the sutta, it comes from the Vasudhimaga. And that's what we determined with this. Now, I have to go over this with the Pali teachers. It's one of my pet things. I want to go over it step by step, but these sections are are part are coming from the Visuddhi Magga. He never teaches these insights when you hear him teach. You can go back to 2003. He never does it from then all the way till now when he teaches Satipatthana. Have you ever heard him do it, Bhante? You never have. So each one of these, when you look in here in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, you see the the um, the the. Um, the insight, the way it's described, and then Bhati's describing to you what we're, what you actually have to do in the higher sense. And they're two different things. And the detour in this understanding happens when you read the section and the insight, the section and the insight, the section and the insight, because the meditation that's determining the insight is not what we're practicing. Do you understand? 
Does that help you to understand it? Okay, it will get, no, it you, makes sense. Yeah, read yeah. it now and then let's talk about it again because I think you'll begin to see what that's talking about becomes vital for them when they're over here doing this practice. But with us, we're way far over here, way going down the path is more important to us. And I don't know how to explain it to you, except that way. Hmm. See? Okay, yeah, makes sense. And in Vipa between Vipassana and us, the routine Vipassana that we see in us, what keeps coming up to me when I, you know, okay, here's what I want the solution for, and now I'm gonna sit, and then I come out, the first thing that comes up for me is body, 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 body. And over here with us, the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind. And I say, why? Well, because this is the command center and we're going to go to the command center to confront the issue for the operation of the whole entire body and the mind. That's what we do with TWIM. So uh, is that one short enough that way <laughs> to say that one little piece, Bhante? <laughs> <laughs> because it, it, it is more of a concern with, bot, with the body, body, body thing and all the feelings and all that stuff that goes on in discussion with the Vipassana approach, see? But then when you come over to us, we say, but why do we have to keep obsessing with from here down? Why? When this is the command center, why don't we go directly to the general and question what he needs to know here in order to change our whole life. There is nothing in the text that says change your body and you change your, um, you change your life. Nothing in there that says that. Only changes in your body that occur is if you change something in your mind that straightens out your body. Go back and check because I did that for a while and I watched it. I can't find anything in the text where it's saying change your body, change your life. But I do see Change your mind and change your life. I see that. Okay. Anybody else? Ulysses. Yeah. Ulysses. Two yeah. comments. Two comments. One in respect to what Making was asking in all the comments that you said um, this week because of the retreat that I'm doing as well. Um, uh, the 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 paradigm shift for me was shifting to the mind because you know as as I explained the last time you know I have this issue with arthritis. And right now I can, I can feel it, but it's not, I'm not being a slave of this pain anymore. You know, I, it is there somewhere out in the background, but it's not affect. It's not, it's not in my foreground. And as a result, I'm, I have been able to actually, it's been the, the entire week already. I haven't taken any painkillers. And so, so, um, so the, the arthritis is not running. My body is not running my activities. I have still been able to type and play the piano and do everything. See that? Um, is there, yeah, but it's not, it, but it's not in the, it's the, the place is not in the foreground. It's in the background somewhere out there and it's not important. Yeah, I understand. So that, I just want to say that, yeah, right. I just wanted to say that because that's, that's, that's very relevant to, to what May Kim was asking. And then I think that is true pretty much for everything else as well. Uh, so the only actually, question I had, I, if, if, oh, I just want to say, so actually May, if we talk about internal and external, do you see how he went internally to change something externally? Do you see that? With what he just explained? Yes, yes. He, he went to the internal to change the external. It's That's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift because before I was thinking like, you know, how how do I stop the pain? How do you know like how do I get rid of the you know the psoriasis spots? How do I like it's all about, all about the outside, the outside, the outside? And mm -hmm. then when when Sister Kema said to me, she said, no, the, the the command center is up here. It's in the brain. You know, That's right. um, this tells you you know you need to you need to go there. So I went there, and then suddenly the this pain is not running me anymore. So, so that, yeah, but I did have just one quick question and I hope that we can have a yeah. specific answer because I, I know everybody's watching the time. It's <laughs> about, uh, earlier, t earlier today you were mentioning about uh, something about when we're in, in meditation and sometimes you can't tell whether you're asleep or, um, or, or you're actually, you're actually dis, um, disengaged. Asleep, asleep and, then, and then you said, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then you said, and then you said that when, when uh, the way to know was to immediately stand up and walk around and then there will be a sign that will tell no, you no no wait that, no no don't mix it up okay if you're, you're if that happens to you and you're not 
in that level yet, but if you, if you are in that level, you fall into that level, it's neither perceiving nor non-perceiving that you fell into. Grasp that first. Neither perception nor non-perception. So what did it mean? It meant you were in a state that was not sleep. And when you come out to examine that state in the text, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the main commentary, it, it does explain this. You're supposed to take a walk. And you take a walk and disappear. <laughs> Wait, let's see if it comes back. I, I only asked that because I oh, oh can you can you hear me I can't see you anymore but if you can hear me you take a walk and you simply recall what happened that's all you say to your mind let's recall what happened as you're walking you just be quiet and then the thought will come up I saw a big light then six are it I saw blue, I saw pink, I saw a pattern, I saw um, cu you know, some kind of a shape. And that kind of thing is what will pop up. And each time you 6R, 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 keep smiling. You can giggle at them when they come up. You can giggle at them and just keep letting go of them, okay? Yes, okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, you are there. I don't know how that got down there. Okay. I don't know. It just went on the bottom. That's what I mean. That little guy in there, he's working overtime inside my computer. He just does stuff. <laughs> I'm not even touching the computer. And he ended up at the bottom of my front page. Right down. I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, Ulysses, uh, yes. you are, if you are having this uh, kind of a, if you believe that you are in a, that state, no. then you don't get up immediately. You stay, uh, st uh, uh, try and stay there for as long as possible. This oh. is other than being in sleep, uh, sleepiness, sloth and torpor. This is not sloth and torpor. Yeah. Okay. No, that was not the feeling I had at all. It was, okay. then it was very, um, it was just you very, don't get up. Yeah. you don't get up, you start, uh, you try and stay in that state as long as yeah. possible. What and I'm talking about, when I, yeah, up. the angle that I'm talking about it from is most time people will have this experience in the morning sitting, they'll come to their um, meeting at one o'clock when we start the afternoon uh, uh, interviews and walk in and then we can actually tell them, I do want you to know this bunch, we can tell them, now go out and take a walk and ask your mind what happened in that session. Of course, See, that. So the retention is so strong and by the time you're to this level, your cooperation between communication with mind, it's really good. So he's, the mind has got it and you want it, him to, you want her, you want the he, she to empty. <laughs> I call the mind the he, she. Okay, the, the he, she has to empty completely before you fall, can fall in sensation. You don't want any preoccupation. Past and future stuff is gone by then. Very few, if any, hindrances are coming up at all in, in nothingness, you see? You can still have hindrance pull you out. And the interesting thing about hindrances is when you're in, uh, in these any of the jhanas one two three four or infinite space infinite consciousness or nothingness okay how do we deal with an aware jhana you're not having the um the distraction in the jhana you're you're it pulls you out and the distraction's happening and you six r and fall back in because you're aware you see understand so if i kind of drew you a picture it would be like here's your line and then there's a distraction, you're up here and you let it go and you fall back in and keep going. See, like that. And then again, like that, see? But if you would only just embrace the laws that are concerned with the hindrance and the truth of the nature of how it operates, write them down, put them on a poster, put them in the bathroom, put them on the ceiling, put them by the front door. <laughs> So you keep
keep seeing them until you understand the hindrance has nothing for me don't feed the hindrance the hindrance is just coming to, to, to try to bother me but it's my decision the truth is the hindrance is not to be you never say the hindrance is bad it did it to me you're not allowed to because if you want the truth about what happens with the hindrance it's nothing to do with the little hindrance. It's a thought up here. And who decides to leave their object of meditation? I do. And who moves the attention from here up to here? I do. This guy did not come and get me and actually pull me away. It's the language problem. We keep saying that it won my mind wandered from here. We want to blame it on you can't blame it on me. Shh, shh, shh. I didn't say it was your fault. No, don't blame it on me. Shh, shh. Okay, it's not your fault. The mind, you want to blame the mind for the hindrance. It's not the mind's fault, and it's not like me, mine, and myself. The hindrance just happens from the brain, see? So you let it go and don't pay any attention to it. And pretty soon it'll know that you don't have strawberries, ice cream, or pizza for it anymore. <laughs> it just keeps coming over to get your attention. And you finally have to get it to understand the, 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 the refrigerator is empty. <laughs> There's nothing here for you anymore. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have a question? We are already two and a half hours. Uh, do you want to continue? Yes. <laughs> are we okay? We are we done? <laughs> are we done? What's twenty? I don't know what twenty is. <laughs> okay, so this is seventeen, eighteen. So that's seven, eight. So it's eight. Oh my! It's almost nine. <laughs> okay. Yes, you have a question, Ingrid. Go for it. Oh, I can't hear you. Why can't I hear you here? I also can't hear you. No, I can't hear her. So, but her little, it's not, no, no. I, how do I tell her? Remove you. What? Oh, no, now, okay. Now it is, huh? It's okay. Can, no. Can you can't. remove the headphones? Remove the headphones. Take the headphones off. Can you say something? Say something. Speak. You speak. <laughs> no, I can't hear. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, you have to write me a note, okay? Write me a note. All I right, don't know. In the chat, uh... Is her volume completely off? Her volume? Maybe. Oh, you know, I can't tell you how happy I am. This is happening to somebody else. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm the only one that has somebody in the computer. <laughs> Everybody else tells me I'm crazy. <laughs> now she has somebody in there fooling around inside. Somebody is inside the computer and trying to... I have an e email uh, to you. You should, Ingrid, you should email me. Uh, wait a minute, I have to do it this way. I know how to do it. Wait, wait. Um, this is really cool. I do know how to do this. Um, Sister Kema uh, yeah. at Yahoo. Yeah. I sent her the email address. She has. Oh, did you do that? <laughs> That's okay. Can you get on the chat? On the chat? Oh. There's yeah, five. She's there on the chat. Okay. There's. Okay, what all is on the chat? Okay. Okay. okay then. Uh, so sh should we end it now? Yes, I think so. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is everybody happy? Is everybody happy, right? Okay. We went, wait a second. Okay. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. 
May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.